dozens of cardiovascular specialists from around the world are in New Orleans to kick off the American College of Cardiology's 60th Annual Scientific Session and the Innovation and Intervention Summit. Welcome to CardioSource Video News. I'm Dr. Randy Martin. And this is day one of a three-day blitz of late-breaking clinical trials and cutting-edge scientific sessions here at ACC 11 and the I2 Summit. And we're going to be bringing you the latest breakthroughs, and we'll also interview the key clinicians and leaders in the college. And I'm very pleased to be joined once again by our outstanding panel of experts. They really are outstanding. They didn't pay me to say that. Outstanding panel of experts. The first is Dr. Peter Block. Peter, as you know, is professor of medicine and director of the Structural Heart Program at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. Then Dr. Christopher Cannon. Chris is Associate Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Chris is also Editor-in-Chief of Cardiosaurus Science and Quality. And last but not least is Dr. Tony DeMaria. Tony is Professor of Medicine at the University of California in San Diego. And Tony is also, as you know, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Well, esteemed panel, I'm uh, glad to have you, glad to see you again. I didn't Here, pay you enough. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I had other <laughs> adjectives that I could have used, but I decided not to. But, you know, what are you looking forward to in the meeting generally and then today? Peter, I'll start with you. Well, you know, it's a teaser morning, and uh, partner is the big deal coming up. And I think the important thing to remember is that at TCT, we heard about partner non-surgical patients right. against uh, right. medical therapy, right. and that was sort of a layup. Now we have a non-inferiority trial against surgery and transcatheter uh, valve replacement. It'll be interesting to see how it comes out. All of us sort of hope that the transcatheter valve will win, but it doesn't really have to win. It's just going to be a non-inferiority trial. So we'll see. I don't know. Chris, what do you think? Well, this uh, has been a big change already in practice. We were one of the partner institutions, and we have people being sent all over for the partner B of the inoperable right. uh, patients. And it's really transformed care for these very sick patients with aortic stenosis, often with multiple comorbidities. A, a tough group, but a big new option for them. And so whether that applies more broadly to have a, a percutaneous option will be very exciting to see. Tony? I think there are a couple of things about the partner trials. First of all, are these uh, percutaneous valves going to go the same way as angioplasty? First, it was single vessel and then double vessel, and now it's, it's open to almost all coronary patients. So we start with, with the percutaneous valves only for patients who aren't candidates for surgery. Is that ultimately going to go to, uh, to a, a, a match between any patient with aortic stenosis? The other thing that's interesting is that the uh, PI, the presenting uh, uh, person for partners, is a surgeon, uh, Dr. Craig Smith. Right. And, uh, and it's interesting because that gets into the interface of cardiology and cardiac surgery with these percutaneous valves. And it, it's, go ahead, go well, ahead. Well, you know, I think there's a, a very important thing that'll come out of this. And these are all very high risk patients, SDS scores of 10 to 15. So. One of the things that we're going to learn from this is exactly what Craig Smith, I think, is going hopefully to say, and that is surgery may not be so bad for these folks. We may be surprised by how good the surgeon's outcomes are compared to what we think they might be for high-risk patients. I mean, that's going to be if, one of the issues. If, if that happens, go ahead, Chris. I guess. Well, I think the other aspect of this is that this is the second time where it's more of a team and that everyone is right. there together. And these are often patients that you know, you're not rushing off to do surgery because of comorbidity sometimes. And so sorting out as a team, this might be someone good for surgery. This one, well, let's try the valve because there's, you know, bad lung disease or other aspects. And so I, I think a, a team approach has really been emerging that much more collaboration uh, to sort out what's best for patients. It may give us a lot of options for yeah. our patients that Tony, are high they're risk. Gonna, I think they're going to also be looking at cost. There's some kind of the a second portion of the presentation is cost. Right. Uh, and and that, that'll be very interesting because uh, obviously these devices, I think they're in the thirty to $50,000 range uh, uh, to put in. And so the device itself is, is probably going to be the equivalent of the whole surgical procedure. And I think the follow-up is going to be important. If, if there's more medical follow-up, uh, 
with the percutaneous valves, then that's going to be very costly. But it's, I mean, I think as, as you all have said, it's already changed the thinking of, you know, the cardiology fellows and, and young cardiologists are all saying, well, I'll, I'll put in a, you know, a valve now because if you need another type of operation, you might need one of these. This is a different question than what they're looking at, but, but the excitement over the over this technology, I think, is, is, is palpable, really. But, but you make a, a really good point. When we published, uh, or it's in press, uh, a series, uh, quite a large series of patients with valve and valve, and it's kind of changed my thinking about Absolutely. whether to put in a bioprosthesis or a mechanical valve now, because if you put in a bioprosthesis, then that patient's a candidate for a percutaneous oh, I, valve. I think it, it, it's a, why don't we, we're going to take a break. Not that we couldn't talk all day here about this, <laughs> sure I know, but they don't want us to. But so we're going to take a break, and we're going to be right back to continue to look at some of the upcoming highlights of the meeting. Stay tuned for the latest coverage from ACC 11 and I2 Summit 2011. Well, immediately what we noticed is patients telling us that they really preferred the radial approach. Uh, they, when, they, when we first started doing this, they came to us expecting that we would be doing this via the femoral approach. They came expecting uh, a, a prolonged bed rest time. They even warned us, they said, look, I've got a lot of back problems, I'm, I'm gonna have trouble laying flat. And when we started doing it from the wrist and they were able to get up and ambulate right away, they were really thrilled. Welcome back. I'm again joined by Drs. Block, Cannon, and Demaria. Sounds like a law firm to me, but uh, <laughs> you know we've just got through talking about the partner trial. And before we went to break, Tony, you were uh, twitching down there. So, do you have something else you wanted to say? Well, no. I, for, for the panel, it just strikes me that these valves are available and have been used in Europe. I understand thousands of them have been put in, and here in the United no, States, no. we're waiting with bated breath on the partner trial. We're out of sync here. Uh, Peter, uh, Chris, uh, are we too stringent in the United States, oh, or are they cowboys Tony. in Europe? Oh, my God. Don't go there, Tony. <laughs> you want to talk about the budget deficit? Is that what you want to talk So what do you think? Well, I think the short answer is yes. But uh, one of the interesting things about the European data is we have so much information from Europe already, and now we have a randomized trial, which gives the other perspective. But if the two superimpose, and we, in fact, have data which supports each other, then I think we really have a solid foundation to moving ahead with this technology. My guess is it's a good thing that we're careful, but on the other hand, we are behind, no question. Chris, you want to jump in on that? Well, you know, from many perspectives, the SDA has taken safety to the nth degree, right. and I think that does, there's, one can be overly cautious and that holds back, you know, treatments that could be available. Um, it's always good to be careful in general, but sometimes it does hold back innovation. You sound Maybe like a senator at a, at a <laughs> hearing. <Yeah. I> think. <laughs> although <Go ahead>. although <laughs> you could say no, if the partner trial were absolutely negative, if half of the, yeah. the TAVIs embolized, then we'd be looking at these saying, Europeans we, uh, and yeah. saying, uh, what uh, were you doing without data? And speaking of what, you know, what were you thinking about, what else are you thinking about at the meeting? Because there are a lot of uh, other interesting trials going on. Well, I, I, you know, I, I personally think the, uh, the rival trial comparing radial with, with femoral catheterization is going to be practice changing. And, and I base that not so much on the trial, because I, I don't know the results at the moment, but rather on the fact that that is the rule throughout most of the right, world, except right. in the United States, where it's actually less than 10%. And so I suspect that the United States will move that way and that rival will be positive. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm, I, I, I admit I'm not a radio guy, and uh, I've done <laughs> I a I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, done a, I've done a lot of radios, but I just think it is safer to do it from the femoral artery, not because a regular diagnostic calf can't be done easily and safely from the arm, but if you get into trouble doing a percutaneous intervention, it's really hard to bail out from the wrist. But we'll see what the uh, yeah, trial the shows us. You know? Yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. Chris? Uh, we probably will change the way we think about things, though. I would agree with you. Chris, you got any other thoughts? Well, it's a, it's a learning process that people have done the femoral approach for so long that really do have to learn. And, 
you know, unfortunately, during that process, people right. can have some bad outcomes. So hopefully it'll be a progressive starting with lower risk, you know, diagnostic cases and leaving the higher risk ones, you know, for a more standard approach. What I about will tell what you that patients, patients, patients are going to love this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? They go home in two hours and they're smiling. They can walk. Yep. It's really nice. Yeah, patients. and and there are less bleeds, <coughs> and there's no question that at least statistically, bleeds do correlate with uh, adverse events. Yeah. All right, let me let me jump in. Other things, there are a lot of uh, neat other trials going on in late breaking. Give me some other examples, things you're I looking th I forward think, to. I um, think Magellan with Rivaroxaban, uh, uh, we're, we're going to see. This is for DVT now. Right. Uh, which is, for, for most of us, a lesser uh, indication than atrial fib. But nevertheless, most of these patients uh, who had DVT apparently were not post-op. They were congestive heart failure and, and settings where we would we would be taking care so of So the whole patients. concept of an oral versus an IV agent. Well, that, uh, you know, in this medical population, often the medical ICU, uh, people sit around there for days with various conditions, and so that's a setting where uh, one can certainly develop DVT and then PE. Hey, it's an oral drug. And right. so, oh, yeah. you know, it, it'll look at both the, uh, you know, sub-Q low molecular heparin versus oral, and then also an extended duration. They're taking a pill, they're going to give it for five weeks to see whether that could improve the longer-term prevention may not be relevant if people are out of the hospital, et cetera. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but uh, that w that's, I, I did, didn't like that aspect of the trial because what they did is they have five weeks of rivaroxaban and they only have an oxaparin for one week where most of us would put that patient on warfarin, I would right, think, at right. the current time. So they've proven that rivaroxaban is better than nothing. But I'm I'm not sure that they've proven it would be better than Enox and then right. and then Warfarin. Let me mm -hmm. let me ask you uh, the Stitch trial because we yeah. we were t chatting about that. Tell me about the Stitch I trial. I think the Stitch trial is an interesting trial. You know, we are interested in whether surgery versus medical therapy for people that have ischemic or dead myocardium really is good, and which is better of the two. And we I do personally a ton of PET scans to find out whether or not people have viable myocardium and if they do and they have a long and I can't easily do a percutaneous intervention I just send them off to surgery now the question hopefully answered by stitch will be does that make a right strategy is it better to send them to surgery or treat them medically it's a fascinating area that we think we know a lot about but in fact, there has not and, been a trial. And, about. and the population base is going to grow. Yeah. I mean, we know that. That's Chris, right. what, do you, what do you think? Well, about I've the got someone in the midst of this who just had his PET scan that was wildly positive for unsuspected uh, viable myocardium. So I guess I can use this to guide. And it's nice to have randomized trials of questions that we face you know, once a week in this type right. population yeah, when we're, yeah. you know, on service. So. Well, we, you know, I'm going to. You're not going to get to say anything. I'm sorry. We're going to have to close. I don't out. have anything to say. <laughs> well, that's, that's why I, I looked at you and I could tell that. So we want you to check back with CardioSource Video News throughout the meeting, and we're going to be bringing you the latest breaking news, plus you're going to hear from the primary investigators and the newsmakers. And as an extra added bonus, you'll get analysis and opinion from our expert panel. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Randy Martin.